people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. start with this uh, recap of last night's title fight in the women's light flyweight division over there in Luna Park. Argentina. For what were the vacant WBO and IBF titles, the former champion of Argentina, Evelyn Bermudez, against the unbeaten up-and-comer from Mexico, Tania Enriquez, the younger sister of the legendary Kenya Enriquez. Fighting families, the both of them. Evelyn, the younger sister of Daniela Bermudez, Tania Enriquez, the younger sister of Kenya Enriquez. Fighting families, that's what they are. Fighting is the family business. Business. I couldn't make up my mind about this thing ahead of it. I won't lie to you. I mean, I knew that Evelyn Bermudez would have a work cut out for her opposite the ring, Tania Enriquez, but I wasn't sure if Tania was ready for the moment, ready for this on foreign soil. In the first round, gotta remember, Evelyn Bermudez had home field advantage. Evelyn, who got off to a fast start in the first round to the eye, she was the faster puncher of the two, faster overall, even though Tania Enriquez had a noticeable height advantage, reach advantage. Evelyn got off some big shots, and she was faster and busier to the eye in the first round. Tania's length and her counter shots gave something for Evelyn to have to work around, though overall, Bermudez banked the first round for me. Landed some big right hands. And I gave Evelyn Bermudez the first round. I gave the second round to Tania Enriquez, who managed the distance against the shorter woman in Evelyn. Tania Enriquez is noticeably taller, noticeably longer than Evelyn Bermudez, and in the second round, she used that to her advantage, keeping that lead hand, that jab hand, in Evelyn Bermudez's face. Evelyn Bermudez, the orthodox fighter, Tania Enriquez, the southpaw. Evelyn had a bit of trouble getting around those long arms from Tania Enriquez, using that jab and setting up Evelyn for shots, stringing punches together in the second round. And a good variety of punches from Tania Enriquez in the second round. We saw good straight shots, good body shots, good uppercuts. Second round was a better round for Tania than the first one was. So Evelyn Bermudez threw out retained a certain quality, a certain explosivity that Tania Enriquez didn't have. I gave the first round to Evelyn, the second round to Tania, the third round to Tania. Moving and punching, boxing well, setting up Bermudez, continuing to set her up. Started landing hard towards the tail end of the round and stunned Evelyn Bermudez. Rattled the hometown fighter, the hometown hero, slipping in body shots in there as well. Fourth round was a lot more chippy. I felt like Tania Enriquez had done enough to win that round, but I'm not stupid. In a round where it's hard to separate the fighters, where it's hard to separate them, and it's close enough and tight enough that you could swing it either way, the judges are going to swing it the hometown fighter's way, and the hometown fighter is Evelyn Bermuda. So I had it two rounds to two, tie score after four, three rounds to two after five, with Tania Enriquez taking the fifth round. Managing the distance and setting up the shorter Evelyn Bermudez, working from the outside using her length. There were a couple of head clashes. It did have Tania Enriquez picking up the fifth round. She was tagging Evelyn Bermudez in the fifth, tagging Evelyn, who looked visibly tired. Three rounds to two in favor of Tania Enriquez after five. Three rounds to three, tie score after six. Felt like Evelyn Bermudez may have edged the sixth round, just nicked it behind clean shots towards the tail end of the round, eye-catching shots. Most of the round, it seemed like Tania Enriquez was in control, but I felt like Evelyn might have stole it from her towards the tail end of the round. Three rounds to three after after six, four rounds to three. After seven, with Enriquez up and taking the seventh round, controlling Evelyn throughout. Controlling her with the jab and setting her up for counter punches, counter shots. Though Evelyn Bermudez did get off an eye-catching punch towards the tail end of the round that visibly stunned 
Tania Enriquez. She was hurt by the punch. So I still gave Tania Enriquez the seventh round. I gave Evelyn Bermudez the eighth. Four rounds to four, tie score as Evelyn Bermudez was on a rampage in the eighth round. She knew she had her woman hurt, she smelt blood, and she got after it. She started laying into Tania Enriquez, backing her off, letting big punches, big shots go. Four rounds to four, tie score after eight. Five rounds to four in the ninth. Evelyn Bermudez continued her aggressive assault of the away fighter, Tania Enriquez, in the ninth round. Watching it live, I figured that the judges themselves, they likely had Evelyn Bermudez up by a wider margin than I did, though. From the ninth going into the tenth, I had Evelyn up. I had her up by a round, just a round, though all the same. I had Evelyn up. Five rounds to four in favor of Evelyn Bermudez. Five rounds to five after ten. Tania Enriquez mounted her own aggressive assault of Evelyn Bermudez, who was visibly spent, visibly tired in the tenth and final round. Yeah, but then she was really tired. The tenth and final round. I had it five rounds to five. A draw, but I knew... A draw on foreign soil? That won't suffice. It was a very, very competitive fight where it was very difficult to separate both fighters at times. But I knew if I've got it five rounds to five, the judges, the judges themselves. They likely have Evelyn winning the fight. That's exactly what happened. Evelyn Bermudez is once again a unified champion in the women's light flyweight division. One of two unified champions. Just two. Argentina's own Evelyn Bermudez holding the IBF and WBO titles and Mexico's own Jessica got Niri Plata holding both the WBC and WBA titles. I think she's supposed to be having an immediate rematch with Canada's own Kim Clavel. Very good fight. No complaints about the judge's decision. It really was a fight where it was hard to separate them at times. One or two swing rounds in there, and you could have swung it either way. They swung it to Evelyn. It just is what it is. I feel like what won Evelyn the fight is that more often than not, she was the aggressor. I mean, consistently throughout, she was trying to close the distance to get off big punches. Even if it meant taking some shots on the way in, Evelyn Bermudez, she did stay in character into the eye. She was a bit more explosive than Tania Enriquez was. Both fighters hurt each other throughout the course of this fight. I saw both Evelyn and Tania rattle each other's cages with shots, but it did seem like Evelyn's punches were a bit heavier than Tania's. But Evelyn was a bit quicker to the draw. A bit faster. More explosive and just a bit, just a tad bit stronger than Tania Enriquez. She is once again this division's WBO and IBF champion. Congratulations to her. We'll see what's next for Evelyn Bermudez. In men's heavyweight news, Eddie Hearn reveals ticket sales for Joshua Comeback it's difficult times. Let's not beat around the bush here. The enthusiasm around Anthony Joshua's next fight is not akin to what we've seen in previous fights, previous instances at the height of Anthony Joshua's boxing career. It's not Joshua versus Klitschko, but who's expecting it to be? It's difficult times. We've sold 14,000 tickets at the O2. We've got a couple thousand left, which will all go. The fighters get their tickets this week, so there aren't going to be many left. But he needs to make a statement, and he needs to get people excited about Anthony Joshua again. We all love him. The country loves. But do they believe in him as a top heavyweight? April 1st, we will see. There is still approximately three weeks left between now and fight night. If they have in fact already sold 14,000 tickets, then it's safe to say by fight night, they may very well sell out. If they did in fact sell that many already. But that hasn't stopped the Boo Birds cackling in light of Anthony Joshua's most recent defeat at the hands of Oleksandr Yusik for the second time. These guys would have you believe that nobody's interested in Anthony anymore and nobody wants to see him box. Nobody in the UK. That market. The same market where Derek Chisora, right. a journeyman with losses in the double digits, can still rake in a seven-figure payday off his own name alone, his marquee value. You're telling me in the UK nobody wants to see AJ box again? The same UK where Derek Chisora still sells tickets? The same UK where, when push came to shove, Amir Khan versus Cal Brook still sold out, in spite of both fighters being clearly past their best. Did good numbers at the box office and at the gate. It was a pay-per-view and it actually sold. But you're telling me Anthony Joshua can't sell nothing no more. Nobody wants to see him box. Some believe the decline in his popularity stems all the way back to his loss to Andy Ruiz Jr. at Madison Square Garden in 2019 and was then amplified by two defeats in a row to Alexander Yusik. Next month's meeting with Franklin is without question 
crucial for Joshua, as defeat would almost certainly spell an end to any ambitions he may have had of becoming a three-time world heavyweight champion. They treat Anthony Joshua different than they treat other guys. They play by a different set of rules with him. If they've already sold 14,000 tickets, and there are still approximately three weeks left before fight night, it's conceivable that they will sell out, or at minimum, sell most of those tickets, but all these guys want to talk about is how Anthony's not the same draw that he was. They want to tear him down. Give him a hard time at a time when he's already being hard on himself, per Eddie Hearn. AJ felt the Usyk rematch was a disaster. I thought he performed really well. I myself agree with that sentiment. I do happen to think that Anthony did better in the second fight than he did in the first, even if he still lost. You saw the improvements. But apparently he considers the whole thing a disaster. That guy's being hard on himself and believe it or not that's a good thing i thought he performed very well against Usyk in the second fight hearn told boxingscene.com still could have done more but after nine rounds i think he's winning the fight and then Usyk closes out unbelievably it was brilliant but he felt it was a disaster and i kept saying to him you did all right you lost 115 to 113 to a pound for pound number one guy forget the first fight tactics wrong and you still could have done more the second fight was more competitive than their initial bout a 12 rounder, Usyk won by unanimous decision in September of 2021 at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in London. Listen, even the great heavyweights, even the greatest of the great heavyweights lost fights. Lennox Lewis lost to Oliver McCall. He lost to Haseem Rachman. He got stopped by Haseem Rachman. Very dominant heavyweights like Vladimir Klitschko. He was stopped by Ross Purity. He was. Stopped by Lamont Brewster and Corey Saunders. And he still went on to reign for a very, very long time. I still see him as a top three heavyweight, Hearn said. If you put Deontay Wilder in that mix as well, top four, because it really is Fury, AJ, Usyk, and Wilder, you've got Joe Joyce, who could be in that mix, but his best win is Joseph Parker. So we've still got to see. AJ, don't be harsh on yourself. You're still one of the best in the world, but he doesn't want to be one of the best in the world. He wants to be the best. And we'll see where he's at against Jermaine Franklin. For whatever reason, people are quicker to write off Anthony Joshua than, say, Deontay Wilder. Even though Deontay Wilder has, in fact, been stopped more times than Anthony. You'd never know it based on people's reactions, but Anthony's only ever been stopped once. He might have lost three fights, but only one of them was by way of knockout. Wilder's been knocked out more times than Anthony Joshua. In fact, Wilder's been knocked down more times than Anthony Joshua. The knockdown near knockout many, many years ago in the Harold Sconeers fight, which seems like ancient history to some, is still relevant here today because it still counts. The knockdown in the Sconeers fight, the knockdowns in the Fury fight. But you let these guys tell it, you let Anthony Joshua's critics tell it, and you think that he's been knocked down and knocked out more times than that guy when it's the other way around. Perception is a funny thing. In truth, most of Anthony's critics happen to be big Tyson Fury fans. And the only reason that they talk up Deontay Wilder is to indirectly talk up Tyson Fury for having beaten him. That's all that is. Smoke and mirrors. Though if Anthony is being hard on himself on the heels of his latest loss, believe it or not, that's a good thing because what that means is he still cares. He still has a desire to be the best. Now when that desire wanes, that's when you gotta worry. He's gone as far as changing trainers, yet again, giving his corner a complete overhaul, and not just changing his corner, but changing his decorum overall. He's training with Derek James now, in Texas, alongside Frank Martin, alongside Errol Spence Jr., Jermel Chalo. I think he's gonna knock out Jermaine Franklin. I think that people are a bit harder on Anthony than they are on other fighters, and that gives you a false representation of things. You don't think he can knock a Jermaine Franklin out? In case you forgot, Jermaine Franklin was in fact hurt. He was buzzed by Dillian White in the Dillian White fight. And you don't think Anthony can stop this guy based on what? Because Usyk beat him? Like Usyk is just some bum that walked in off the street? I think Anthony's gonna get back on track. I think Anthony's going to stop Jermaine Franklin. Beyond that, we'll see what happens. Seems to be a story out there that former UFC champion turned network and promotional free agent Francis Ngannou has spoken to Eddie Hearn already about potentially facing Anthony Joshua in a crossover boxing versus MMA fight. According to Ngannou, talks are already underway regarding his professional boxing debut. Although he has no boxing experience, he expects to jump straight into a blockbuster event against a marquee opponent. He has expressed interest in current or former champions Tyson Fury, 
Fury, Deontay Wilder, and Anthony Joshua. My next step has to be boxing, Ngannou said. I want to do one boxing match first and then maybe go back to MMA because I still enjoy MMA. I want to do a couple of fights in boxing. We are working on some stuff and hopefully in a month or two, I will be able to come out with an announcement on a potential fight date and location. It's taking a little longer than I expected, but it's coming along. Big things come with time. It doesn't look like it'll be Tyson Fury that Francis Ngannou ends up crossing over with because Tyson Fury's supposed to be fighting Usyk at the end of April. Or May if the fight date ends up being pushed back and that's a distinct possibility. I'm considering everybody as an opponent. I talked to promoter Eddie Hearn about Anthony Joshua. I don't know what's going to happen. The most that we have spoken with is Deontay Wilder's team. We've been having some exchanges, basically coming to some sort of verbal agreement regarding his MMA future. And Ganu said he's keeping his options open. He confirmed he has talked with PFL, one championship, and to a lesser extent, Bellator MMA. Originally from Cameroon, and Ganu said a personal goal is to compete in boxing or MMA in Africa. He noted that next year will mark the 50th anniversary of the famous Rumble in the Jungle event between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in Kinshasa, Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That's where Martin Bacoli is from. Based on this, it seems that talks for a Wilder fight might in fact be further along than talks for a Joshua fight. We know that Joshua is scheduled to face Jermaine Franklin very soon, next month, early next month, but Wilder, he ain't got nothing on schedule. I always wanted to have an event in Africa, Nganu said, to fight at home, but also to give my people a show, an opportunity to see all those big events and give a gift to the kids to believe in this sport and let them know that anything is possible. I'm still working to bring something to Africa and I will do that. That that's my personal mission. Wilder versus Nganu in Kinshasa would be a monumental event. It would be massive. The best of both worlds, so to speak. A former heavyweight champion versus a former UFC champion. In a boxing ring, Deontay Wilder would so obviously be heavily favored to win. I mean, marquee value aside and potential revenue aside, from a sporting sense... It's a mismatch. Deontay Wilder is currently under orders to face Andy Ruiz, former unified heavyweight champion Andy Ruiz, by way of the W. BC and it feels like there's been a wavering commitment. I mean, Deontay Wilder did say that we can expect to see him back in the ring as early as June. You think he's going to fight Andy in June? Or Francis Ngannou, based on this, talks for Wilder versus Ngannou seem to be further along than talks for Joshua versus Ngannou or Fury versus Ngannou. Based on what Francis has got to say about it, and that's the most insight we've had in reference to those talks. In the sporting sense, it would be better optics for Deontay Wilder, a former champion, to skip out on another former champion like himself and Andy to go box a novice, a guy with no boxing background, no experience in the sport. If he did it, he'd do it for obvious reasons, because the bag for Nganu is much bigger than the bag for Andy Ruiz. It is. And if Wilder ends up facing Nganu instead of Andy, what do you think? You think at 38, 39 years old, he's gonna circle back to the sport of boxing? He's gonna make all that fucking money for an Nganu fight so he can come back and fight Andy for what? Box Andy for what? I don't know what's next for Wilder, you understand, but if by some chance Nganu is next for Wilder, he'd make a lot of money from that fight. Minimal risks involved. At this age, would he even bother to keep boxing serious boxers?